The two most powerful weapons are time and patience. This quote was said in the 19th century, in fact, by the famous Russian author, Leo Tolstoy. And now let's just take a moment to consider the time period we're talking about. This was the 19th century when the world proceeded in a fashion that was more mechanical than it is today, with a greater sense of predictability, with a stronger sense of schedule, with a greater sense of time management than what the world is today. But even in that age and time, Tolstoy recognized that time is not just an entity, it's not just something that governs our day, it's a tool, it's a weapon, it's a warrior that we as humans have the power to utilize, have the power to manipulate, and hence also have the power to manage, to do our being, or to follow the way we want it to. And so, in continuation, uh, I'd just like to start by mentioning the crux of the argument that I'm about to present to all of you. Uh, time management has a few very key principles. Um, leave emotion behind, remove distractions, proceed in an orderly fashion, and make sure that you know what you're about to do. Plan for the future, micromanage. That's essentially the key principles that we know are or make up a, a part of time management. Now, my point here is that time management, yes, it's a skill. Every, but however, it's a skill that anybody and everybody can learn at a point in their lives. I'm sure that all of you here today have, to some extent, achieved a degree of what you could call success in terms of managing your time. So raise your hands if you have schedules for yourself in any, of any form. Raise your hands if when you write your exams, let's say a month before your term finals, you go down, you sit down and you look at what subjects you have, you look at the different requirements of each subject, and you sort of plan your time. Just a show of hands if you do that. All right, so let's, let's be mathematical here, all right? We have, uh, we have 24 hours in a day, all right, out of which, Reasonab it's reasonable to assume that eight hours go into sleeping. Uh, eight hours are usually, for kids of our age, uh, taken up by school commitments, or for older people, university commitments, or work commitments. Now that leaves us with eight hours of what I like to call judgment time, or decision time, where we're pretty much free to choose how we utilize that, right? Now in those eight hours, let's say two or three hours are taken up by necessary activities like eating, showering, whatever you want, what, whatever the common activities that a human has to carry out daily. Let's say two or three hours out of that eight are gone. You have five hours left. Let's assume that we're right now 30 days before a term final or an important examination that you're about to sit, sit for and you decide that out of the five hours that are left to you, you're going to commit three hours to academic commitments every day. Where does that leave us? Three hours a day, 30 days, reasonable to assume that a month is 30 days, and that leaves you with 90 hours. Now, being a part of the IBDP curricula, I have six subjects, so I'm going to make that assumption and say that I divide my time equally amongst the subjects. Now. Disclaimer, this is a quite rudimentary assumption uh, in the sense that it's not practical to assume that you're going to spend the same amount of time on each subject. And it's also not reasonable to assume that you're going to have exactly 90 hours. But for the purpose of this exercise, it suffices. So that being said, you leave yourself with about 15 hours per subject. All right, and let's say you decide that, okay, you know what? Now I'm gonna make a timetable for myself. I know what I have to do, I know how much time I have, I know exactly how much time I have every day. So now I can plan myself, I can micromanage my time. I can decide that, all right, tomorrow I'm gonna be doing an hour of physics, an hour of chemistry, and an hour of computer science. And then day after that rotates to an hour of economics, or whatever subject you want, whatever subject you feel like studying at that point. And let's say you actually sit down and plan out an entire timetable for those 30 days. All right, now I'm probably gonna say something that might seem a little, well, 
challenging the norms, I guess, but that's, in my opinion, the worst way to go about managing your time. Because what you're doing is you're limiting yourself to what you've set out to do. Essentially what you're saying is if I said that tomorrow I'm going to be doing this, this, and that, those are the only three things I can do in that day. You're micromanaging to the extent that you lose creativity. Now, being a student uh, and being a teenager, uh, our average attention span is scientifically set as 20 to 30 minutes, all right? So that means that we can't pay attention to something for more than 20 or 30 minutes on average. Now, let's say you set out to do an hour of physics, or let's say, forget about physics, let's say you do three hours of academic commitments in a day. And you decide that those three hours you're going to sit with your books and only your books, no distractions. It's statistically proven that 80% of this time is wasted by teenagers when they sit out with just books and no distractions. And now that brings me to sort of my argument or my point that you can't micromanage time. Instead, you have to manipulate it. You need to be able to understand that you have to have a planned distraction available. So where you go wrong is when you get distracted by an unplanned activity. But let me just give you an example. So during my term finals last year, um, I also had a national level basketball competition coming up immediately after that, which meant that I had to dedicate a certain amount of time to that. And that may not seem important during finals, but you have to spend time. And now, if I set out to do those three hours of just academic commitments, that would have never worked because as has been proven, 80% of that goes to waste. Instead of that, if you take breaks, if you break up that time into parts and let yourself have a planned, a productive distraction in between, that's when you actually make better use of the time. So now let's, let's sort of rewind and bring it back and say, you have five hours now because you're not micromanaging the three. And in those five hours, let's say you decide that 50% of your time is going to be a planned distraction, whether that's a hobby for you, whether that's browsing YouTube, whether that's watching TV. It's all right to do that even when you're under the pressure of a final examination or of, in fact, any achievement that you want to accomplish, even if it's coming up in the near future. You need to be able to relax. You need to be able to be creative with your time. You need to be able to let go of some of that stress that's building up. And that's the key importance of time manipulation. So now, before I move on to uh, a major concept that I want to bring up, I will sort of break off a little bit here and talk to you about something uh, that psychologists deem the 8 p.m. to 12 a.m. sleep concept. Now, it has been scientifically proven that an hour of sleep between the hours of 8 p.m. and 12 a.m. is equivalent to two hours of sleep at any other point in the day. Now, where does this play a role in how you manipulate your time? Well, s looking at this is pretty obvious. You decide to, ma you, you need to sleep for eight hours a day, let's put it that way. Now. You can either maximize the sleep you get in these four hours and be more well rested throughout the day. You're not giving yourself more time, that's not possible, but you're making sure that the rest of the time you have, you're spending it more productively, you're more active, you're more fresh, whatever you wanna call it. And so that's why I feel that this was something important to bring up before I move on to uh, my, well, the biggest part of this talk, which is uh, the Eisenhower time decision matrix. All right, and this is what I like to call the modern timetable, all right? Um, so what you do is essentially, instead of dividing your day into time periods and specifically micromanaging what you do at each time, you divide your day into the tasks or accomplishments that you have set. And what you do is you split it up into four categories and so I like to call them, uh, I, I, named the, I like to name these four categories by the four elements that make up our world. Uh, so the urgent and important category is, I will name it fire. Uh, the not urgent and important one, I'm naming it water. 
the not important, uh, sorry, the not important and not urgent. Not important and urgent is named Earth, and not urgent and not important is called Air. All right, and now what you need to understand is that once you set these accomplishments and you realize the tasks that are urgent. So let's take a tree, for example, and you set a tree on fire. All right, what's the first thing you have to do to reasonably let that tree survive and grow? Set out the fire, which essentially means you need to accomplish those tasks that need to be done in the moment. And that's where you get the first quadrant of the decision matrix. Now the second step is you need to water the tree after you've set out the fire. The damage it's done can only be recovered by watering the tree. And that brings me to the second quadrant, which is sort of the second level of actions or accomplishments that you need to devote your time to accomplish. How you devote that time does not necessarily need to be micromanaged. You do not need to say that I'm putting one hour into this small specific task and one hour into that small specific task to reach this major goal. You need to say that I have this much time or I have a given deadline and I need to accomplish these tasks in this order of priority by that given time. And automatically, once you go through the matrix, once you realize yourself which tasks are more important to you, you will eventually end up finishing or accomplishing most of these tasks. And moving on to the third quadrant, that's the earth, so soil. For a plant to grow, it needs soil. That's where the roots are laid. That's the foundation. And so that's next. After you water the plant, you want to make sure that the soil is in good condition so that the plant can continue to survive. And then there's air. And the air tasks are the ones that, uh, well, rigorous time managers like to call distractions, but in my opinion are just nearly as important as the fire tasks because you need those distractions. A tree can't survive without the air, right? It's the same way. Maybe it's not as essential as putting out that fire. Maybe it's not as essential as putting the water, but at the end of the day, it needs the air, it needs the atmosphere to survive. And if you don't give it that atmosphere and nurture it to make sure it survives, then, well, putting out the fire did no good for you, right? Bottom line is the tree is still going to die. And it's the same thing here. You need to be able to allow yourself time to explore activities that interest you or that may seem as a distraction towards your main goal, but then end up sort of bringing up that energy when you need to perform the more important tasks. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you an analogy. So in the modern world, um, Singapore is known as the least creative country on the creativity index. Uh, I'm, I'm excluding countries like North Korea, Russia, where the economies are <laughs> severely controlled by governments. Um, and let me give you the reason for this. Any deviation from the system in Singapore is met with a harsh penalty. And what does that do? It limits your creativity. Every single thing is planned. The entire country, the entire architecture, the road systems, there is very little scope for chaos. And if you think about it, chaos is what's building the modern world. You have to embrace chaos to be able to survive today. And what that's doing to Singapore is, in fact, it's limiting its maximum earning potential. It's limiting the extent to which it, which it can grow. Now, as all of you probably know, it's a very good country to live in. It's safe. It has basic necessities, a good standard of living. But the potential it gives you to grow beyond that is just cut out by the fact that the system is so rigid. And this is what micromanaging your time does to you as a person. It limits your creativity, it hampers your potential, and it just doesn't allow you to grow to the extent that you could. Now, this is not to say that timetables are redundant. This is more to say that you can't possibly hope to know exactly what's going to be happening at any given point in time. Because as far as I know, future telling is, well, it's not real. So you really can't predict the circumstances that can come up. Let's just take a very simple example again. You decide to, um, let's say you decide to study waves in physics and you get to that time which you've allocated an hour to do that. And then you realize that, well, I'm really not in the mood to study that. And you know, when you 
when you've planned out your day so at such a micro level, all that leads to is tension, stress, and other such toxic, toxic uh, characteristics or attributes. Because then what you feel is that I've planned something and now it's not happening. What do I do? You don't, you haven't planned, you haven't prepared yourself for the unforeseen. And that's where you end up failing as a time manager. And that's where in the modern world, time management is now slowly becoming time manipulation. And um, so again, this is just a reiteration of what I meant by time management versus time manipulation and how traditional time management principles have caused, well, a lot of, ham well, have hampered creativity to a great extent. And with that, I'd just like to end on a small note. Um, remember that time doesn't control you. You control your time. You may not be able to create more time or add more time to your day, but you can definitely manipulate it to make the best out of it for yourself. Thank you.